Welcome to the Plant Trainers Podcast, where we're helping people improve their quality of life through nutrition and fitness. And now, your hosts, nutrition and wellness coaches, international speakers, Adam and Shoshana Chaim. Hey, I'm Adam Chaim. And I'm Shoshana Chaim, and we are Propelled by plants. plants. Today we bring to you episode 241, Compassionate Living with the Buddhist Chef, Jean-Philippe Cyr. In today's episode of the Plant Trainers Podcast, we talk to the Buddhist chef, Jean-Philippe Cyr, about the meaning of compassion and how it extends beyond the food that we eat. He explains how Buddhism is really the path to vegan eating and how the foods we prepare can affect your overall psyche. Of course, we talk about his amazing website and all the videos he produces to make vegan cooking easy for anyone. He points out that people often feel defeated before they begin because the ingredient lists are too long or the recipe pictures are just way too beautiful. He hopes to help everyone bring tasty vegan cooking into their homes so that everyone will be happy eating it regardless of which food groups they normally consume. And you'll be really interested to hear what he has to say about soy. Please share this episode on social media as it is soy good. I see what you did there. Did you see that? Jean-Philippe, a Quebec native, just like we are, has been Buddhist for over 20 years. He attended the École Hôtelière de la Capitale in Quebec City, where he excelled in French cuisine and classic techniques. After graduating, he apprenticed, among other establishments, at the acclaimed French restaurant Le Saint-Amour. He then continued to evolve as a chef and master cooking techniques in gourmet restaurants in Quebec, including the Capitole, a renowned dining establishment. Now, he shares his passion and what he has learned with all of his subscribers and followers via his website, The Buddhist Chef, La Cuisine de Jean-Philippe, in which he publishes simple and tasty vegan recipes as easy-to-follow video tutorials. When he's not in the kitchen, he loves spending time with his beautiful wife and two dogs. We want to thank everyone for their support with the Yummy Foods Activity Book for Kids that we recently published and is now available on Amazon and Kindle. We know it's being used in homeschooling programs as community outreach materials, as well as a way to keep kids busy learning and having fun without electronics. We wanted to share a few testimonials. Happy customers have left. And this one's from Jessica. I love learning about new foods. Still being a fairly new vegan family, I would love for them to learn even more. I was pleasantly surprised when we received the workbooks and every one of my children, ages 1, 3, 8, 10, 12, and 16, took interest. Wow. Well done, Shoshana and Adam. This book is interesting, fun, informative, and I feel good about the fact that my kids are not only wanting to play with it, but they are learning at the same time. Win-win. This one's from Timothy. The recipe activities are great. No stress. It's a way to bond with your kids in the kitchen and teach basic kitchen skills. I recommend it for homeschooling, church-based programs, and presentations to elementary school kids. The worksheets can also be used as fun activities to test basic food literacy knowledge in adult-based presentations. To get yourself or a young one a copy, visit the link in our show notes, which is planttrainers.com slash yummy foods, or search yummy foods on your country's Amazon site. And now for a moment of gratitude. A few weeks ago, I was having a really hard time getting out of bed in the morning. I felt exhausted and unrested, and I've really taken steps to take care of myself, make sure that I'm in bed at a regular time, and really watch what's coming into my body. And waking up now is a lot easier, so I'm very grateful for the time that I've spent on myself. You may have noticed on our Instagram stories that I've been posting some post-it notes that I've been receiving from my family. And I'm just so grateful that our kids are starting to do things like this. I got these great notes from my daughter in my lunchbox that was surprising when I opened at at work. And I wake up some mornings and there's a paper on the night table that says, Mom, Dad, you're the best parents in the world. So I'm just so grateful to have such great kids that are doing and expressing themselves in such great ways. Jean-Philippe Sear, thank you so much for being on the Plant Trainers Podcast today. Thank you. We're very excited to hear about your philosophy and all of the recipes that you have out and some other things that you have along the way. But before we get into all of that, do you have a moment of gratitude that you'd like to share with us and our listeners? Uh, Today I'm grateful because of one comment that I had today. I have a lot of comments on the social media. 
But this one particularly, because uh, there was this woman, uh, she told me that for a week, her family didn't eat meat, and they didn't even re realize it. So they didn't realize it was vegan. That's <laughs> so, uh, amazing. That's amazing, because I, I, I try to reach a broader audience, and people that are not really used to eat vegan and can be intimidated by uh, vegan cooking. So I'm very glad that I, have, I get this kind of comment for, for, for a normal person, <laughs> let me say, you know. That's very that's very high compliments because normally when it's people who are used to eating that way and they love your food, I mean, that's amazing. And any compliment feels amazing, especially when you're on this side of the microphone or this side of the computer. You don't know who's out there, who's reading your stuff, who's really doing things. But when it comes to when it comes to real omnivores or when it comes to people who don't even realize that's that's a very high that's compliment. That's right. Because yeah. as a vegan, I mean, it's good for vegan food. You know, sometimes we're like, oh, it's not bad for vegan food. You know, but when it's someone which who's used to to eat normal food, you know, or a very standard American diet, when they they like the tofu a tofu recipe, for example, they're so proud of it. I'm proud I ate tofu, you know, and everybody liked it. So uh, that, that's that's tofu is challenging, but I mean, you you have to to know how to cook it. That's my mission. Did they share with you what kind of recipes they were using during that week? They were using the recipes from my, the French version of my book, okay, which has a lot of uh, carnivore-friendly recipes like lasagna and uh, meatless pies and, uh, you know, more comfort food. I wonder if it was your dad, because Adam's dad will always say to me, hey, this is actually pretty good. And I'm right. like, you think I'm feeding you like cow slop? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, every exactly. time he, every time he comes over to eat, it's like... Oh, this is actually, actually good. I can't believe it. And it's that's right. It's like, of course it's good. Like, why would we eat food that's not good? And just because it's not containing animal products, why wouldn't it be good? Like, I don't get that sometimes. And it's it's funny to see that reaction. And it's quite often that we see that reaction. I think it's because of the eighties. You know, I grew up in the eighties, and uh, I had a hunt. A hunt. My hunt is she was she was like a hippie. And she would always come up with those. She would she would uh, go on the uh, on the grass and pick up like uh, weed and stuff and serve it to us without no salt whatsoever. And uh, you know, so it was pretty tasteless and boring. But uh, I mean, there's so many choices now. You know. You know, in the '80s, I was eating TV dinners. Yeah. Oh boy. I was all yeah. salt. Yeah, it was bad news. <laughs> salt and starch. But, but that's the thing about the standard American diet. They want their salt, their sugar, their fat, and by providing them with great recipes with healthier versions of that that still have those flavors and tastes, that's how people can transition and eat less animal products without losing that flavor that they're looking for. I mean, I have nothing against sure, a little bit of maple syrup here and there and a little bit of oil, of uh, olive oil. But when it's just that, like standard American diet, there's nothing beneath it, you know? There's no foundation. It's just food with, uh, it's, it's bland otherwise, you know? Like crap dinner, like TV dinner, like, you know? There's nothing in it except for sugar and salt. So the other night in preparation for this podcast, I went to your site and I wanted to make one of your recipes. Um, mm -hmm. For those people who don't know, you could go to thebuddhachef.com and you've got amazing recipes out there. But not only are the recipes amazing, but the way in which you set it up, because you have those quick little videos that show your hands creating the recipes yeah. and you actually have the recipe on the side also so that you could see exactly what to do. And I love that for my children because they can watch that video and then they could go to try to reproduce what you've done before. And I'm the type of person where I very rarely make a recipe from a cookbook if I can't see what the outcome is supposed to look like. Yeah. So we watched the black bean pudding oh, yeah. recipe. Yeah. And yeah. my daughter goes, ew, we're going to put black <sighs> beans in our pudding. And I'm like, George, we got to just follow through. Let's see what happens. So we went and I had frozen black beans already that I cooked myself. So we put oh. the... The, we defrosted those, we put the black beans, we put the maple syrup, we put the uh, salt and cocoa, vanilla, yeah. and, and then we, we didn't put the cocoa powder, and then oh. we started to make it, and I'm like, why is it light brown, and why isn't it dark brown, <laughs> and then she popped up, she's like, mommy, we forgot the cocoa, so oh. we, we put the cocoa in, and um, we had a beautiful little dessert, all of us, and I posted it on social media the other day, oh, nice. and it got a lot of great 
comment on it uh, over at Plant Trainers, but also, you know, the kids enjoyed it and they ate a quarter can of beans, right? Like yeah, we got right. a quarter can of beans into us, which was, which was great. And it was delicious. It was easy. So yes, you, you'll use oil from time to time. You'll use um, maple syrup, things like that, but it's so tasty and it's so delicious. And it gets people interested in new recipes and people like I've never thought of black beans before. So we've gone ahead and inspired so many other people to try it. So yeah, that's really exciting. Fun. That's right. You have to make it fun too when you cook with kids, you know? Absolutely. Try with muffins, try, try, start with uh, cookies or anything which is fun, which you can, that you can manipulate, you know? It's very, very important to, to get your kids to cook, I guess. So you're known as the Buddha chef. So tell us right. a little bit about where this idea of Buddhism comes from in veganism, terms of your life. Yeah, <laughs> veganism and Buddhism, uh, I mean, goes hand in hand. It's all about compassion. I've, I'm interested in Buddhism for 20 years now. And I had this uh, idea of the Buddhist chef while cooking at my meditation uh, center, retreat center, where I uh, I did my I do meditation retreats and I go as a cook as well, which is all vegetarian, all vegan. And uh, I was like, why not call it the Buddhist chef? Because at a meditation center, we don't use we don't, not only we don't use animal product, but you're not allowed to uh, kill anything, you know, a ant, a, a spider, a, uh, a mouse. So you have to deal with the fact that if you don't keep it clean, you can't get rid of the, 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 the mice. And a spider, for example, you know, you take it gently and take it outside. And when you come back home and your wife uh, sees you uh, walking around with a spider in the, in the glass, she's like, what are you doing? You know, but it became normal at one point to, uh, to practice compassion for every animal, you know? But you have to start, I think, by realizing that uh, even the smallest of the animal is important. And sometimes people uh, have this debate about is, uh, you know how vegan vegans are sometimes, yes, but are insects uh, vegan, is plant, are plants vegan, you know? I get a lot of comments about where to draw the line. I mean, I'm pretty pragmatic about it, I mean, it has to be easy to eat vegan. So if every time you, you try to eat a carrot, you're like, oh, am I doing the, the right thing by eating a, a carrot? I mean, it's not really uh, feasible. So come back to, to go back to your question. Yes, I, I, I'm Buddhist and uh, I chose this name because I think not only Buddhism lead to veganism, but the, it can be the other way around, you know? Veganism, sometimes it opens your mind to to compassion and uh, to empathy, which is uh, the root the root of Buddhism. Are all Buddhists vegan? Not at all. In Thailand, for example, where I travel, uh, monks eat they eat what they, they, they they've been given. So every morning, they uh, they walk around town and uh, in those little villages. So if they've been given fish or whatever, they have to eat it. But um, any kind of Buddhism, it's all different. It depends on, on the country, you know. Let me ask you a question, because you mentioned the spider. So I, we're both Canadian. You're living in Montreal, where Adam and I were born and raised, and now mm -hmm. we're in Toronto. So our winters are pretty awful. And what happens for those people who are down south who don't really know is once it starts to get very cold in the fall and the winter, all the spiders come in from outside. They find their way into the inside of the house because that's shelter. It's getting cold. They want shelter. And then we're stuck with all of these. Well, I mean, they're not everywhere, but you tend to get more spiders throughout the fall and winter than you do in the spring and summer. But picking up a spider and putting it up outside, and this is something that I've been struggling with, picking up that spider and putting him outside is almost worse than killing it because That's I feel right. like it's yeah. going to die anyway and it's going to suffer for that from that cold. So I've kind of just come to the realization that they're going to just have to share the house with me. That's right. And I'm going to have to have just have leave them. Every, yeah. every, every uh, sense and being, every living uh, insect has a purpose, you know? Yeah, so, you know, so, in, in the summer, I'll put them outside, but in the winter, I just can't bear putting them outside because I think that that's worth yeah. that, worse than a fast death, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's like this time when there was a squirrel in my swimming pool, and I was trying to reanimate the squirrel because my wife is a doctor, and uh, she, she, was told, she was telling me, okay, you have to do it, you do that. And as soon as the squirrel got better, the, my dog ran and put, took the squirrel. And, oh, shame. You know? That was the end. So never heard of that squirrel, but you know, 
I mean, you do what you can you, with what you have, but nature is going to take over at one point, you know? Definitely. They're definitely going to take over. So when you became Buddhist and, and vegan, were you still a chef in an omnivore restaurant? Were you still cooking meat? I was cooking meat while I was Buddhist, but I came to the realis to a realization one night when I was hired, uh, it was five years ago, I guess. I was hired to serve uh, lamb to 400 people, and uh, ironically, it was, uh, it was taking part in a funeral home, and uh, 400 people worth of lamb, it's uh, lamb chop. I mean, I had this, uh, th this is where I made the connection between you know, the animal and the plate. And I said, okay, now I'm going to cook only vegan food because I've, I've heard this podcast about a chef who was uh, all about Buddhism and very famous chef. And every every morning he would, he would pray and light a candle and blah, blah, blah. But he would still cook animals. And, you know, but I understand because uh, it's dissonance cognitive, as we say in French, you know, it's the it's your brain doesn't make yeah. that cognitive, cognitive, cognitive dissonance. dissonance. Yeah, that's right. It's just your values and your actions don't, don't don't fit together. But what is the implication of listening to this little voice in your hair in your head? You know, for some people, you have to quit your job. That's what I did. You know, but it's easier to to pretend that uh, you don't care. You know. So, what kind of emotions came up for you? I think it's. We don't realize that it's barbarian to kill animals and that many animals just for the, for the, for the pleasure of, your, of our taste, really, because it's not essential anymore to eat animals. It's essential to eat less animals or not at all. So uh, I think we're very, on the surface, we look like, it looks like we're a very evaluated society with our credit cards and our iPhones and everything, you know. But we still eat like 400 years ago you know and i think it doesn't make sense but the more you travel uh, into big cities for example i went to san francisco this year and i've been told that in berkeley 25 percent of the students are vegan and you go to berkeley there there are it's not even written vegans vegan on, on the menu it's vegan you have big shops and pastry and butch, butch vegan butchers and it's like it's kind of normal you know but here in the countryside, it's more challenging. But, you know, even in the countryside, you can find the vegan options. You can, especially That's in right. your garden. That's <laughs> you right. You can start right there. Start in the garden. Right. Start with the side road little farm stands. You know, that start with your grocery store. There's definitely foods that are prepared tend to be less vegan. Um, mm. But if you're going to take it home and you're going to cook for yourself and cook from love and cook real food, then you're definitely going to have... Lots and lots of options there. You always ask me where to start. Start by cooking, by learning how to cook. It's very simple. That's why we're trying to teach our children at a very young age to start to learn where the food comes from and how to prepare it. We're very big on food literacy these days. We've published a book, our Yummy Foods Activity Book for Kids, which is basically all puzzles. But there's lots of reading that they have to do before they start the puzzles, which really gets them thinking about where food comes from, skills that they're going to need in the kitchen, little recipes that they could do on their own at the end of the book. And that's something that we do with our own children. We play word games. We play fun games. We bring food into it. We teach them where food comes from. We grow little gardens in our garden, but most of all, giving them the skills to be able to cook for themselves. And my son was making hummus and potatoes at the age of, I don't know, probably around four and he knew that the most important ingredient there was love, which was always really yeah, cute amazing. when he said that. Yeah. Um, but just, you know, like the other day we were doing that bean recipe with my daughter and she decided to make salads a couple of months ago out of nowhere. And she'll make salads and she'll put fruits and vegetables and all kinds of things in it. And as much as it makes a mess and as much as I've just cleaned up in the kitchen when she decides mm -hmm. to do it and it's yeah. inconvenient, I really make sure that I go out of the way to allow them to explore what they want to explore in the kitchen because it's more than just learning how to write or learning how to draw, it's a skill that they're going to need later on in life and always. And I don't want them to have to rely only on prepared foods, rely only on, you know, fat and salt and sugar. I want them to, right. to create recipes themselves and to be able to follow recipes. And, you know, 
I, yeah, we use maple syrup and we use, you know, there's all different kinds of ingredients that we use. And I think it's important for them to understand how they affect their body and how they taste and what they can do with it. So that's a really important thing for us to start with the children so that as adults, they don't go through what a lot of adults our age are going through and just learning about these things for the first time. Yeah, because children, they don't know what it's, what's, what's normal, you know. The, you, you teach them what's normal. It, 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 it's for them, it's normal to eat beans and rice and tofu and tempeh, you know. That, that's the norm. They, they're not like us uh, growing uh, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, learning that it's normal to eat uh, chicken like three times, eat meat three times a day, you know. We're taking a pause to let you know this episode of the Plant Trainers Podcast is sponsored by Health IQ. Health IQ uses science and data to secure lower rates on life insurance for health conscious people like runners, cyclists, triathletes, strength trainers, vegans, and more. As we get older, we get scared about applying for life insurance because traditionally, the older you are, the worse rates you get. But imagine being 20 years older and getting a better rate on your life insurance because you recently started training for life, eating more plants, and taking better care of yourself. That's what happens when you apply for life insurance with Health IQ. You get the best rates on life insurance for being in great shape and living a healthy lifestyle. Health IQ customers save up to 33% on their life insurance because physically active people have a 56% lower risk of heart disease, 20% lower risk of cancer, and a 58% lower risk of diabetes compared to those who are inactive. And vegans have 9% lower risk of cardiovascular disease and 15% lower risk of all-cause mortality. Like saving money on your car insurance for being a good driver? Health IQ saves you money on your life insurance for living a health-conscious lifestyle. These savings are exclusive to Health IQ, and you must qualify to get the special rates. To see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com slash plant trainers, or mention the promo code plant trainers when you talk to a Health IQ agent. And now, back to the show. Also, kids are learning, and, and we've grown up just having more and more and more food. When you're done something, you eat something else, and... We're just, we're overeating as a society also. And I think that that falls in line with the Buddhist ways of not having too much and just having what you need. Is that right? That's right. Because, uh, you know, we never had so many choices and we never made so so poor choices, you know, with our food. I remember not so long ago, there wasn't so many choices. But now we have so so many choices and we, we make the same choice that we made uh, we were making uh, 30 years ago. I think it's really important for us as parents to be leading by example and teaching our kids at a young age. But what about those people that struggle with that, that don't know how to prepare things in the kitchen? You're a trained chef, that's your trade, but they may not be. And going to your website, you have beautiful videos and recipes like we mentioned before. And somebody watching that might say, oh, this looks easy, but they might get in the kitchen and then be like, I don't know what to do. I could follow it, but it's not going to look out like their confidence level might not be there. Is it always going to turn out exactly like you make it look like on your website? Should that be something they should be concerned about? I mean, let's be honest. In the Internet, even when you, you buy a book, a cookbook, sometimes half the recipes you try doesn't work. It, it just don't work. Yeah. Because it's sometimes it's not it's not trained chefs. It's more uh, designers that make blogs and you know try to uh, everybody's passionate about food, but uh, you know they get their inspiration from uh, Pinterest or they try the recipe and they, they tweaked it a bit. But I'm a chef and I I want to make sure that everything I put out is bulletproof, you know, and. My tofu with uh, spicy peanut butter sauce, for example, I think there's, there are five, five ingredients in it. It's basically soy sauce, peanut butter, and uh, free ratchet sauce, and tofu, and a little bit of, uh, of um, vegetable broth. So sometimes people try a recipe, it doesn't work, and they blame themselves. You know? They're like, oh, I'm, I'm so, oh I, can't, I, I can't cook. I mean, sometimes it's the recipe that just doesn't work. And uh, I, I try to remove... Uh, unnecessary ingredients because when you open a book you look at the recipe and they're like there's like 30 ingredients I mean I'm not gonna try you know and you have to move to New York to buy the ingredients you know? <laughs> because you know I live I live uh, near Montreal but it's it's kind of a country, it's the countryside here and if I can't find an ingredient at the, the grocery store here I just substitute it you know 
I learned to cook in Thailand too, and they were using galanga and uh, you know uh, Thai basil. And it, you can you can find it in Montreal in the frozen section of the Asian uh, grocery store, but not everybody uh, have access to the, these uh, these products. So I substituted. But you have to start where you are when 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 cooking. And my wife, she's 36 years old. She started cooking three years ago. You know. And now she, it's a passion. You see it in adults too. You did. People that just, they just didn't cook and one day they try it and they, they find out it's, it's not so hard to cook and now they just want to cook every, every weekend. What are you cooking, you know? So uh, that's it. I was never good at following recipes before. So I would kind of just almost follow the recipe or make it up myself. And I ended up making right. undercooked butternut squash soup, basically yeah. raw oh. pureed, <laughs> raw pureed soup. Like there was lots of things that I did wrong at the beginning. But then, like I said, I love to see what the final product is supposed to look like before I start a recipe. And also if there's 35 ingredients and it's not like salt and pepper, then I'm, you know, I, I'm flipping the page also because that's just way too many ingredients. I don't have the time or the patience to read that. But what yeah, I also... Yeah. What I also learned was that when you do see the pictures, and this is something for people to take in mind, the pictures are made as art. The pictures are made yeah. to entice you. They're made to make your mouth water. They're made to get you yeah. to, to want to try the re recipe, but it's put together in a way where they're using tweezers. tweezers. They're using tweezers to, yeah. to place things in certain mm -hmm. ways. It's being sprayed with water to get a certain effect. So there's lots that goes into the art of these pictures that we're seeing in cookbooks. And we absolutely should see gorgeous pictures because if the pictures weren't gorgeous, we wouldn't want to make yeah. them. But when we're reproducing it ourselves, we should keep that in mind that if it doesn't look identical... The flavor might be identical, but the look doesn't have to be identical because that's made as art. It's part of the book. It's that's part right. of the, the chef's artistic talents or their And their sometimes team. it's not even the, 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 the same food. Sometimes it's just, uh, it's they pretend it's vegan. They took a picture of a, a, a beef burger. You know, it's stock photos, stock pictures. Sometimes they buy, they buy uh, royalty-free pictures, you know. In my case, when I when I, I, I made that shot my, my my book, it was the the actual recipe, you know, because everybody was eating it for lunch. So it has to be uh, it had to be to be good, you know. I think but it's important I, yeah. for it's important for those pictures to be authentic, and for That's the right. people that aren't doing that, I don't think they're doing justice to the consumer. No. And when it comes down to it, you really want. The picture that the recipe is making so that That's you can right. kind of get an idea of what you're supposed to look like it might look a little different but remember we eat with our eyes first so that's something mm -hmm. that a lot of people are concerned about but those pictures have to have to be of what the food is otherwise i'm not going to want to buy that book again if i ever found out the truth right? yeah but you know why because sometimes uh some publishers they say oh cookbook people just don't cook it's just a gift you know, they're going to they're going to they're going to offer the book as a gift. And that's the main purpose of the. I don't think that's that's right to think this way. I want my book to be in the kitchen. I want people to to cook my recipes and to cook. It's not how many times you bought the book. It's how many times you cook, you cook the recipe, you know, and with social media now, uh, if a recipe doesn't work in my book, I'm going to know that's for sure, you know, because people are going to be very vocal about it. Thank God. All of my recipes so far have, uh, have, has, has, has worked, and uh, I've seen it on Facebook many times. Every day I see people posting pictures of, of my recipes and how easy it is and how delicious it is. And some people just comment, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to buy the book because it looks, you know, because it's good." Because I can I can tell anything. I can say, "Oh, it's the best book in the world," blah blah blah. But you know, has someone tried it yet? And when people see that regular people have cooked the recipe and it worked, they get more confident on buying the book. And that's the new marketing of, of cookbooks now. It's social media. So I could hear the listener saying, well, tell me what the book is called already. So I know that the book did come out a couple of months ago in French. So what is the name that's of the right. book? La Cuisine de Jean-Philippe. I use my French name in, uh, in French. Love it. Jean-Philippe. <laughs> Jean-Philippe. <laughs> And my last name is C, so C Y R for Anglophones. Uh, it sounds like, uh, yeah, but what is your name? It's C Y R. Yeah, but what, what's your last name? <laughs> so it's C Y R. But uh, in English, it's going to be called uh, The Buddhist Chef. It's going to be out uh, in 
for Christmas 2019. So we're looking at about uh, a year and a half from now. Yeah, right. People can that's expect right. to get that as a Christmas gift yeah. in, in about a year and a half. And it's going to be, it's published here in Canada and it's going to that's be right. throughout the States in French as well and in Paris, France as in well. In Paris and France in May this year in France and all over Europe in France and uh, in English uh, next year. Yeah, that's right. So I'll be traveling a bit. So what do you find are the most popular recipes that people are making from your cookbook right now? So far, it's uh, mac and cheese. <laughs> Very good recipe for mac, mac and cheese. And uh, I have a, a chicken burger. Chicken, chicken burger. Chicken burger. <laughs> chicken burger, homemade, which is very popular. Sausages. I don't know. It's always like comfort food, you yeah. know? I have kale in this book, but nobody could talk about my kale salad, which is a shame. <laughs> But, uh, you know, people just, they like, so to, even, especially in the winter, during the winter, you know, they like to, I don't know, especially in Canada, it's cold outside. Yeah, we want to eat like comfort, comfort food. So another four months and that'll start to change. You'll see a change in what people are posting. Yeah, there's going to be, uh, there's going to be a bit more kale on the, uh, on the internet. So where do you get your inspiration for all these recipes that you put together? Uh, I get my inspiration more for my career because I used to, to work in regular restaurant when I, when I was not, uh, before I was vegan and my job, I, I've always been, I've always been very creative with food. So, uh, the chef would ask me, okay, now we have $400 worth of mushroom. We have to, to do something with it, you know, and, uh, I would mix something, create something and boom. So, uh, my inspiration comes from the base when I try to, to put together a vegan meal, it's like I used to, to do with regular food with my, when I learned uh, how to cook in school, for example, in French, French cooking. So I don't get my inspiration in Pinterest and in social media per se. And one, one uh, other place where I get my inspiration is in restaurants. Like I travel a lot and we have amazing uh, vegan restaurants in Montreal. And if I can't find out what's in the, the, the meal, the ingredients by myself. I'm always in the kitchen, sneaking around, you know, talking to the chef. And sometimes, oftentimes they know me already. So, oh, what's in this recipe? Oh, it's funny. What did you use? Mustard or blah, blah, blah. And they, they usually, it's amazing. They, they give you the recipe, you know, they give you the trick. And I never take a recipe and do it as is, you know. I always put my, my twist on it. And sometimes I just call, you know, for my Satan recipe. There was this seitan that I, I tasted, I tasted in Quebec City, and I remembered it, and I took the phone, I said, I was like, I, was, uh, I asked to talk to the chef. I was like, oh, I have your seitan, what, what, what did you do with it? Oh, give me his recipe. I mean, everybody wants to share the recipe, you know? So I'm glad you brought up seitan, because I don't think a lot of people know what that is. Can you just explain what, what it is exactly? It's just gluten flour with broth or water, with spices, and uh, it replaces meat. It's, uh, it has this little chewy, you know, consistency and you can grill it after a while. You can, you, you boil it and then it, it's like a meat loaf, a seitan loaf and uh, you can uh, make sandwich with it. You can uh, use it where you could, uh, where you would use uh, meat, for example. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, is that why Crudescence went out of business? Because you stole all the recipes? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> But there was there's a lot of new vegan restaurants, but it's more like regular restaurants because there was a time where Cru de Sans, for example, it was amazing, but it was raw, so yeah, it was right. really you know on the health side, it was more like an experience. But you won't you won't you wouldn't eat there every day, for example, you know. But you would go there and it was wow, oh it's raw, it's not so bad for vegan food, for example. But now you have uh, greasy spoons. Uh, Vegan restaurants, yeah. you know? Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so for those people listening, we're talking about some of the restaurants in Montreal that Adam and I go to when we go back home to visit our family. Yeah. And Crudescence was, you know, it was one of the newer ones. It was one of the first ones out, and it was, it was like eating, it was like eating art almost, yeah. right? And it was cool, That's and right. it was different tastes, and they had a raw lasagna and all kinds of cool yeah. things. You were still hungry after when you were done, especially if yeah. you eat plant based all day long. You, you needed you needed like twice the portion, but it was it was quite delicious. Our kids liked it there too, and they've closed down. But yeah, there are lots of comfort food places opening yeah. all over. But Montreal and Toronto booming with 
vegan restaurants. And I hope for the listeners that you've got some vegan restaurants in your area too. There's even a chain now, the Copper Branch, which no. is which is vegan and that's going Spreading, all across yeah. Canada, which is amazing. And I wonder if it's in the States too. Well, it might be in the States yeah, too. Yeah. <clears throat> so when you're cooking at home for just you and your wife, what is one of your favorite things to cook for the two of you? I mean, we eat a lot of soy, a lot of tofu because it's easy to go to. You can, it takes five minutes to prepare. And during the weekend, we go for, uh, we try to create recipes together for, for uh, next book or for, uh, you know, uh, more like, uh, you know, it's Valentine's Day this weekend. So uh, we're not going to eat tofu on Valentine's Day. We're going to eat a risotto or, you know, something more fancy. Because I think people don't realize that you can you can make a nice dinner with with vegan food, you know. So when we cook together, uh, we cook, we try to to uh, to experience uh, with the last restaurant we went. For example, we went to California lately, and uh, we come back. Okay, let's try this recipe that we had there. You know. I'm so glad you didn't say. Well, we don't cook at home. We just order in our food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And what about if you're entertaining for a large amount of guests, like four or five couples? What would you make? I would make uh, something easy to prepare in advance, like uh, meatless pie and something that people know. Like uh, sometimes uh, they, they, something that they can relate to, like shepherd's pie or uh, lasagna, because they don't expect it. You invite people, you say, uh, you tell them you're going to eat tofu for first, you're not, they're not going to come. Or, so or the, the, the girls <laughs> might come, the guys might stay home. That's right. That's, the problem is always with, uh, I always say start with one animal at a time, your boyfriend, okay? Because it's always the boyfriend. I don't, I don't understand it. People yeah. write, they write me emails, they're like, oh, finally, you know, <laughs> my husband, he agreed on eating tofu and he asked for it, he brought it uh for his lunch the day after, you know. But what's wrong with, with, with guys, you know? Yeah, I think that's changing slowly. I mean, it's taking time, but it is changing. And the more the professional athletes start to become vegan and plant-based, I think more of the guys are going to start to follow suit. I mean, there's that new movie coming out, The Game Changers. I don't know if you heard yeah, about that one. No. It's going to, I think it's going to be a big impact maker on all the men out there really yes do. because uh you know george larac yep. he he i mean if you think uh you can live without proteins look at this guy yeah it's 300 pounds you know yeah. and it's a good example to have regular person you know regular guys showing up yeah for sure it's just that it's not the norm right and uh, it hasn't been and it's hard to create a big change so quickly so it's going to take time but I mean, yeah but it, it's a couple pro project too i, I was yeah. in a vegan restaurant and people were coming to me hey i know you Jean -Philippe, blah 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 and it was always the guy who approached me and like 10 couples and they were all together so every time there's a girl a vegan girl there's a guy and the guy is convinced at one point and he, he's advocating this this lifestyle you know yeah so, so for us it was adam who went first yeah. Me too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. 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 And I was fine. Like, I think a lot of men out there are like, I need to have meat in every single meal. Oh. I was totally fine eating vegan meals, totally fine eating vegetarian meals. But it was like to make it my 100% lifestyle. Yeah. It took me about six to eight months to really yeah. get there. But yeah, for the most part, it is the women that, that go first. But you see some of the biggest changes in men. So if you're watching Forks Over Knives and you're watching yeah. all of these big websites that are showing off everybody who's had transformation, yes, there's lots of women with transformation, but the men are the ones having like huge. But Adam, yeah, and Adam is right. It's the, it's the athletes that, that are going to convince the men yeah. because guys, they, they, you know, they like their sports. So yeah. it's simple yeah. as that. I'm glad you brought up soy and tofu and I'm glad that you said you eat it so often because that's one of the most asked questions is always about sure. soy and after protein, of course, where do you get your protein? Yeah. But obviously you're okay with eating soy, but mm -hmm. maybe you can clarify for the listener, you know, to, that they don't need to be so concerned about soy or do they? But I mean, soy, 94% of uh, the crops are for uh, animal consumption. So you're not going to eat the same crop as the animals because it's full of OGM, 
GMOs, and uh, it's not good. But the soy I eat, the tofu I eat, it's it's grown in Quebec. There's no GMOs in it, so there's no there's no problem with it. Yeah, I don't know where it comes from. Uh, I think for some people, if you had cancer, ovarian cancer, or some type of uh, thyroid issues, like thyroid Hashimoto's. issues, you might be careful. Or if you're intolerant to soy, it happens. But my wife is a doctor. She eats soy literally every day and oftentimes twice a day. So if it were dangerous, she would be the first to, to avoid it. And she, she, she has read a lot about soy. And, uh, I mean, those Asian countries, they eat soy all the time. The, the breast cancer, for example, in, in Asia is, is lower than here. And they eat soy a lot. But I think soy milk is threatening the milk industry, so maybe it has something to do with it. Probably. I don't know where it comes from, but with those clickbait uh, websites now, it's uh, if you want to get popular in, in the, uh, the internet, you just say, don't eat this, don't, dangerous food, you know? Yes. Or, or you find one person in 7 billion who got sick and ate a lot of soy and then you correlate it with them without any scientific right. research and you, right. get, you create a whole big scare. And that's what it's about. It's about marketing your your story and marketing your get, catchy titles and that's what people want to do that's out right. there. And it just sets this domino effect of false information and we really need to look at at soy for what it is and you know yes you want to eat non-gmo organic soy you want right. to make sure that the soy that you're eating isn't soy that's all in these other processed foods right you want to be yeah. eating tempeh you want to be eating soybeans you want to be eating tofu those are the things that you want to be eating and if you're eating good quality and you're not a sick person who shouldn't be eating it in the first place, then, mm -hmm. you know, you go for it. I have so much more to say about soy, but I won't yeah, hijack it, this podcast. It all, it all started with one study. And I, I think it was Weston Price that did it. I don't know for sure, yeah. but it got blown up in the media. And that's where that whole thing started a bunch of years ago. And it just caught fire and went wild. But I agree. That's right. I agree. I don't think people need to be too concerned about consuming good quality, organic, non-GMO soy. There are uh, worse things than soy in our society. You know, you you never see some someone, you know, uh, at the hospital because sick because they eat uh, too much soy. Soy, you know. I spend at least half a session with each client talking about soy and the dangers or non-dangers of it and for them to take to their spouse or their mother or whoever is mm -hmm. scared of that. So we spend a lot of time on that. But there's a lot of people who say, oh, I don't want to give give my kids the hormones or there's estrogen in it or I heard soy is not mm -hmm. bad for you. Yeah. But they're having this conversation sometimes on the way out of McDonald's. Yeah, and I'm that's like, right. I'm like, how is that? That's right. How how is that any better if you're that scared of soy? But we mm. won't go there. We won't go there. But in my experience, it. every time I get uh, I publish a recipe with soy, I always have this person. Oh, don't eat soy. Why? Oh, because uh, I, I I it's never science. It's always like when I was eating soy, I felt like my my hormone level hormone <laughs> hormone level was lower. How can you feel that your hormone level was lower? You know. That's funny. Yeah. It's always like I felt like if you feel like something when you eat something, it's not it's not science. Yeah. You know? it, it's a it, feeling. It, <laughs> yeah. It, and it and it could very it could be it could be true. Like they could be having some kind of effect because maybe they are intolerant in that small that's right. if population. You're intolerant, yeah. If you are intolerant, a lot of people are intolerant to to peanuts, but uh, you know, peanuts are not bad. So talk about soy and talk about peanuts. On your site, you have a really great peanut Thai recipe, yeah, soy recipe right. that you were talking yeah. about. What are some of the other recipes that you love from your website? Uh, general sauce tofu, speaking of soy. And uh, that, that's one of my favorite because it makes tofu uh, more friendly for kids and for husbands. You know, because you put some, uh, you, you fry it a little bit in a little bit of oil. You coat it in cornstarch so it gets crispy, and people don't realize it. I made a, uh, a, a pilot for a TV show, and I went to a welders, uh, you know, where guys they weld huge structures, and I, I showed up with my tofu, uh, general sauce tofu, and they were they were trying it, and they were like, "Oh, this chicken is very good," mm -hmm. and they were amazed how good was the chicken until I told them that there was tofu, and not, no, it wasn't good anymore when it was tofu, right. but. You know, it's very friendly. 
it has a little bit of ketchup in it. So for an introduction, it's very good. But I mean, it's it's kind of a party food. You have to. It's not because you're vegan that you're gonna eat, you know, sugary and salty and stuff every day. You have to treat it like uh, an exception. It's like my chocolate cake. I mean, it, there's su- there are there's sugar in it, a lot of sugar. But it, it, I don't pretend that it's healthy. You know, you have it when you when it's your birthday, and uh, once every two weeks if you like. But there's there's sugar because I've read an article lately saying that those muffins, you know. It was worse. They were worse than uh, than donuts. Yeah. You know? But it's dishonest because you think you eat, you eat healthy when you eat a, a muffin. You know, you don't go for a donut first thing in the morning. Right. Just because it's vegan doesn't mean it's healthy. And no. but it's okay to have those kind of recipes and meals or snacks once in sure. a while, as long as it's not your everyday thing that you're going back to all the time. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so you have a lot of awesome recipes on the website. You have great recipes in the book. Where do you want people to go to get more information about what you've done, what you're doing, and what you have coming up? Uh, TheBuddhistChef.com, that's the website. La Cuisine de Jean-Philippe in French.com, that's the French side of the same website. So it's basically the same recipes. And uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, or YouTube, all of those places. I'm all over the place answering everybody's question every day. That's great. It's, and I like it. I yeah. like to interact with people, you know, because you get feedback in real real time. It's awesome that you're doing that. And I'm sure everybody that you do connect with really appreciates it. And before we let you go, maybe you could just tell our listeners that if they're looking to make good quality vegan food at home, what would be some good tips for them to think about to adapt in, or adopt into their kitchen? First thing I would I would tell uh, someone who would ask me uh, where to start is start with your favorite recipe. Start with your spaghetti sauce, for example. Uh, try to to use tofu instead of meat in your uh, your family's uh, favorites, so people don't get too shaken about you know oh it's, it sounds familiar it's the same recipe and uh, tofu in uh, spaghetti sauce you can't taste it. There's no way you're gonna taste it. Texture when you you use this food processor, it's uh, it's basically like meat. But be curious too, you know. Be uh, try try new things, try new spices. You know, you might you might you might like it. Those are great tips, and we will link to all of your social media that you mentioned before in our show notes as well. And we would like to thank you so much for spending time with us today on the Plant Trainers Podcast, inspiring people. We hope that everybody goes to check out your website and makes a recipe, and maybe they could post it on their social media. They could tag you, and they can tag us at Plant Trainers and The Buddhist Chef, and let us know how they've been inspired from this podcast today. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much for listening to this edition of the Plant Trainers Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or any other podcast listening platforms. We appreciate the feedback we receive from you. Every time we get a five-star rating or review on iTunes from one of our fans, it ensures other people will find us too. Thanks to our patrons. To become a patron, visit www.patreon.com slash plant trainers. Even supporting us with $1 really makes a difference. Connect and follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Plant Trainers. Like Plant Trainers on Facebook, join our newsletter, and check out our website at www.planttrainers.com for awesome plant-based recipes and a list of our services. Email your questions to info at planttrainers.com so we can answer them on our upcoming Facebook Lives. We hope we've inspired you today. Join us again next time and have a healthy day.